is more than just nutrition. It is, of course, a source of pleasure, but most importantly, it has become the hope for relief for millions of patients suffering of chronic diseases. We hear more and more cases where patients heal themselves by changing their diets. Sometimes successfully, but sadly, not always. Like the late Steve Jobs, that in his hope to fight his terminal cancer, turned to nutrition, despite having access to any possible treatment. Nutrition has a huge potential to heal us and keep us healthy. But in order to tap into this potential, we need to first understand how. So we have looked at our digestions for centuries now, and we know very well how this play unfolds. Starting with the first act in our mouth, our stomach, where we break down our food into nutrients while we enjoy a meal. Now these nutrients in the second act are absorbed in our small intestines, where carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, trace elements, all are used to fuel and build our bodies. Now, in our age of self-optimization, there's an entire part of the internet reserved to discussions about how to use nutrition to be a better version of ourselves. Just Google, what should I eat before workouts? Or, are sweeteners healthy? And you'll see this discussion goes back and forth. Me, I spent my entire scientific life dedicated to the third act, the large intestine, more specifically to the microbial ecosystem within the large intestine, our gut microbiome, formerly known as your gut flora. These trillions of bacteria we carry in our guts not only scavenge on the leftovers of our food, but they're an integral part of our physiology, a forgotten organ. And just like an organ, it has its own functions, but also interacts with the rest of our bodies. It constantly grows, and you know that intuitively, because otherwise it would be washed out. And while it grows, it produces molecules that communicate with the rest of our body, with our immune system, with our metabolism, and even with our own signaling. And that's how the microbiome is linked to many diseases, starting with obesity, autoimmune diseases, cancer, and even mood disorders. And that's why, if we want to link nutrition to health, we need to understand the role of the microbiome in it. Now, this combination of a promise and uncertainty, it was polarizes our discussion about nutrition and health. And it gives rise to what I call the four archetypes of nutrition. First, the chemist. He takes his supplements every morning, fighting aging with antioxidants, boosting his immune system with vitamin D. We all know plenty of chemists, right? The religious found a magic food, fruit or berry that does all of this in one and religiously consumes it every day sometimes exclusively just to prove his faith. The monk believes that health can only be achieved through discipline and monk-like control over what we eat, often ritualizing food or even abstaining. And the holistic gives an answer that is as right as it's imprecise. And he recommends to eat a little bit of everything that's currently healthy without wanting to commit to any ranking. Just like our grandparents said, just eat a little bit of everything. And all these people are right in their own way, but they lack a key piece of information to link nutrition to health, the role of the third act of our nutrition, the microbiome. Now, our microbiome grows on the leftovers of our food. And this growth without oxygen is what we call fermentation. And the leftovers of our food are whatever our own bodily enzymes cannot digest, mainly fibers. Fiber fermentation is a heavy work. These long molecules are broken down by a chain of reactions in collaboration of different groups of bacteria in our microbiome. But surprisingly, the outcome is very comparable between all of us. It's basically three molecules we call short-chain fatty acids. And you all know the short-chain fatty acids from other places. 
acetate, the stinging smell of vinegar, propionate, the smell when you open a fresh bag of toast bread, and butyrate, the rancid smell of cheese when a restaurant doesn't bother to change the cheese on the tables from time to time. Now, the effect of the single molecules on your health are very well studied, but it's still a black box how fibers are converted into this mix of short-chain fatty acids that then have an effect on our health. So in order to understand how nutrition affects our health, we need to be capable to map how mixes of fibers through fermentation by our personal microbiome are turned into mixes of short-chain fatty acids that then have an effect on our health. No wonder it took us a while to get a grip on this topic. But I'm not done yet. It gets a little bit more complicated. Not all fibers are equal. Not chemically and not in the face of the microbiome. Fibers, the plant parts we can't digest with our own enzymes, are what scaffold, the scaffold that builds the plants we eat into roots like carrots, tubers like onions, stems like leek, leaves like salad, or flowers like broccoli. Each part of the plant has its specific mix of fibers as a scaffold. And through this mix on the specific parts, it's impossible to categorize foods into a single fiber category. And that's also the reason why we need such a solid team of different bacteria to break down all these fibers we eat every day. And you all know that from experience. We all react differently to different fibers. And every one of you knows exactly what not to eat on a third date. I mean the date where you avoid eating bell peppers that you don't digest very well. Now, intuitively, we know that if we would give the same mix of fibers to each one of you, the outcome would be different. And that's caused by those chain of reactions that take place in the fermentation of these fibers in the gut. The gut is not a very attractive place for bacteria to be. There is no oxygen, only heavy, long molecules, so no easy energy and an immune system that is constantly nagging your microbiome. So the bacteria that live in your gut are highly specialized. They learned to divide the labor of breaking down these long molecules into single steps in which each part of the microbiome gets, gets their slice of the pie and makes it worthwhile for them to live in this hostile environment. Now, we cannot imagine the microbiome as a machine of well-intertangled gears, but we have to imagine it as an ecosystem, a team with a memory. That's why we get used to eating loads of fiber and a reaction to specific challenges. That's why we feel different depending on what we eat. Now, because every microbe in our gut can interact with more than one other microbe, the response of our microbiome is very context dependent. It's very much like my three-year-old son. His capability to eat vegetables depends absolutely on where and with whom he is. At home, incapable of eating vegetables, when he goes to daycare, he devours carrots, broccoli, bell peppers, you name it. Right? And that's exactly how the microbiome works, as a network of interacting bacteria with their own group dynamics. And that's the reason it has been impossible for decades of research to predict how fibers through our microbiome are fermented into a specific mix of short-chain fatty acids. In our company, we spent decades looking into this black box. And we found out that just like with my son, there is little information in studying gut microbes in isolation. It's all about context. So we asked ourselves, how do interactions between bacteria change the overall fermentation activity of different microbiomes? And we decided to study the microbiome in its natural environment. So we took entire microbiomes, yes, stool samples, and grew them in a set of different defined conditions. And we measured which bacteria grow best and how the team of bacteria that grows in this condition 
performs, what does it produce? And by gathering this information, we assembled what we call the Facebook of the microbiome. A data set that describes how the microbiome with these thousands of bacteria interacts in a natural environment. So, in analogy, we didn't look at the CV of the single bacteria in different guts, at their phone book, at their personal profile, at their personal capabilities. No, we looked how microbiomes perform in different environments, for instance, when they digest different fibers. And training our algorithms on this data set, we managed for the first time to predict how your personal microbiome can convert fibers into a specific mix of short-chain fatty acids. A huge piece in the puzzle linking nutrition to health. Now, let's get back to our archetypes. What can we tell them to complete their picture? The chemist knows his vitamins, but should also consider context, what is produced in the gut, not just eaten. The religious should consider that his or her superfood might be personal. You might feel great eating porridge every morning. Other people don't, and now we know why. The monk needs to know that just like a muscle, your microbiome needs training with a diverse set of fibers. So in the current knowledge, there is absolutely no explanation why it should be good to eat rice and avocados only. And the holistic is right all along, but he doesn't answer our question. I believe that we will leverage nutrition for health once we complete our current picture of the first two acts with the third act, the microbiome. We need to acknowledge that not all fibers are equal and that every fiber has a different effect on each one of us. We need to ask ourselves, are we healthy and want to boost our immune system or are we recovering I want it to calm down. It's all about context. We need to train our microbial muscle for the challenge ahead, be it a sprint or a marathon, like fighting cancer, knowing that our microbiome is capable of doing both. I believe that in the future, we will carry our microbial profile with us, just like a fingerprint, unlocking the access to the knowledge of what to eat in which phase of our lives giving us the liberty to eat what we want while staying healthy. Thank you.